Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, honoring Arbor Day on April 26th with an ongoing commitment to sustainable stewardship and conservation of Missouri's forests. Choosewood.com. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. Joseph Smith comes to Quincy as well. And for a period of time, the, the size of Quincy was doubled because that's how many Mormons actually were being harbored in Quincy. The Mormons still today consider Quincy the city of refuge. I'm Sarah Fenske. The city of Quincy, Illinois, is home to around 40,000 souls, but it boasts the history of a much larger place. It was home to some significant stops on the Underground Railroad. It welcomed Mormons after they were driven out of Missouri. It was also the home of the first black man to be ordained in the Roman Catholic Church. A new self-guided tour from Quincy's Convention and Visitors Bureau aims to make that history accessible to all of us. And joining us today with some highlights is Rob Mellon. He is the executive director of the Historical Society of Quincy and Adams County and producer of the History A Go Go podcast. So, Rob, welcome. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So, Rob, there's so much amazing 19th century history in Quincy, but as this tour makes clear, it really goes back further than that, to the mound builders who settled there even before the time of Christ. Was there a pretty significant civilization in Quincy at that time? Well, along the river, there was a significant civilization that wasn't as large as, say, the uh, down in Cahokia, which is a, a very, which would have been a very large settlement. These are mainly burial mounds, but they're very visible. And so if you go to Indian Mounds Park in Quincy, you certainly can see those mounds today. And so is that part of this history tour? You can see where it all began? Absolutely. Yeah, it's part of the tour. And I know Holly does a great job, and that's included, and rightfully so. So the oldest surviving home that's in Quincy, this, this comes many, many years later. This dates back to 1835, and this is the Eels House. Uh, does that go back to the earliest European settlement of Quincy? Well, the earliest European settlement was actually John Wood in 1822, and he built a one-story log cabin down on the uh, on the river, and then eventually he built his mansion the same year the Dr. Eel's house was built, so about the same time. At that time in the 1830s, those would have been the major um, structures were in town, Dr. Eel's brick home down at the uh, 4th in Jersey, and then Governor Wood uh, eventually would become the governor at 12th and State in Quincy, and both of those homes are still available for tours today. Hmm. So beyond just how old this Eels house is, this is a significant site. It's been listed as one of the 42 most important Underground Railroad sites deserving recognition and support. What happened uh, at the Eels house? Well, Dr. Richard Eels was a notorious abolitionist, at least locally. And he was working with the free blacks in, in Quincy. And really, they were doing the yeoman's work. They were doing the majority of the work. There was a slave called Charlie who had swam across the river. That was a, that's a pretty daunting task even today to take a swim across the river. He got to Quincy. Some of the free blacks knew that Dr. Eels could help him. Dr. Eels' house isn't far from the river. It's about four blocks from the river. So they took him to Dr. Eels' house. Like most runaway slaves, you've got to get him further east or further north. Dr. Eels knew that. There was something called the Mission Institute, which was started by another abolitionist named David Nelson. So Dr. Eels was attempting to get Charlie to the Mission Institute, which, if people know Quincy today, would have been 24th and Maine, where Madison Park is. The Mission Institute had one of their locations there. Unfortunately, Charlie was captured. And when Charlie was captured, Dr. Eels was implicated. They Mm -hmm. went back to his home to arrest him. He was arrested. He went in front of uh, Judge Stephen Douglas, who was living in Quincy at the time, and he got a $400 fine for harboring a slave. He had violated an Illinois state law, uh, which, was a, which was like a fugitive uh, law, and um, that's what he was arrested of, and he got a $400 fine from Stephen Douglas. Hmm, did he pay that $400 fine? <laughs> He did not pay that fine, and the interesting thing about it, he died shortly after that. But the, his estate was still responsible for that $400, and that's what got it into the Illinois State Supreme Court. 
and they upheld the original finding of Judge Douglas. Well, eventually, it goes um, to the national court. It goes to the Supreme Court of the United States, and Salmon Chase, who was a senator at the time, but he could still do law work back then, he took up that case, and it was upheld again. So that was one of the few cases from Quincy that went all the way to the Supreme Court. So, Dr. Eels, he was on the right side of history. Were most Quincyans supportive of the abolitionist cause? Well, there were several Quincyans who were. And so John Wood, I mentioned him. He's the founder of the city. He's one that, and Willard Keyes, who was one of the other founders of the city, they were a part of the early abolitionist society or anti-slavery society, the very first in the state of Illinois. So many of the early prominent Quincyans, especially the ones that come from the East, um, they were part of these anti-slavery sentiments. Some of them had more political type views, like John Wood. He was more of a politician. And then you had like real tried and true abolitionists who had religious objections to it, like David Nelson. Mm-hmm. So that's some fascinating history there. The Eels site is, is one of the things on this history tour. You also have the Mission Institute site on this tour, even though uh, that building is no longer there today. Is that correct? Yeah, it was a major complex, actually, and they had more than one site. They had a huge farm that was out about five miles on the outside of town at that time. Now it's part of town. <laughs> the, the, the town has spread. Way back out there. It has, it has. And so uh, there were a couple of locations. One of them was the location that Dr. Eels was trying to get Charlie to, and that was a, near about 24th and Main Street, where Madison Park is just to the north of that, and St. Peter's Church, so those who know Quincy, and of course St. Peter's Church is on this uh, tour as well for other reasons, for Father Tolton. So that's where the Mission Institute was, and David Nelson, who had started in Missouri, actually, he was in Palmyra, he started the first chartered school in the history of Missouri. It was in Palmyra. He's not, it, it's not really well received there. The anti-slavery sentiment there when you have slavery and slave owners all around you, you know, he basically is driven out. There's a there's actually a camp meeting, and a slaveholder gets stabbed, and David Nelson gets uh, accused of that, and he's got to escape, and eventually he makes his way to Quincy in 1836, and that's when he starts the Mission Institute, mm-hmm. which uh, he was a Presbyterian minister. So it wasn't just enslaved people and, and abolitionists seeking refuge in Quincy. The Mormons also sought refuge there. What brought them to Quincy? That's another important part of our history, too. And, of course, the Mormons had history in Missouri. And in 1838, there was the order, basically, that they had to leave Missouri. And Joseph Smith, who was the founder of the Mormons, was in jail there. So the rest of the Mormons had made their way to the border, to Illinois. Of course, they hit the Mississippi River. It's in the winter of 1838. And Quincyans, I mentioned John Wood on a few occasions. He's, He's instrumental in this as well helped the Mormons um, eventually cross the river, and then Quincy, you know, they basically shelter the entire Mormon church at that time in Quincy because they'd been kicked out of Missouri. And then shortly after that, Joseph Smith, he comes to Quincy as well, and for a period of time, the, the size of Quincy was doubled because that's how many Mormons actually were being harbored in Quincy in 1838 and 1839. And, and how did that go over with the population there? Were they welcoming to these outsiders? You know, that's the amazing thing about it, because for that many people to be sheltered, that means almost every citizen in some capacity would have had to help in some way, maybe use a location so they could sleep, and eventually they, many of them started working there. Some Quincyans were converted. They eventually went to Nauvoo, which is a, an excellent town, and in uh, Hancock County here in Illinois. Um, It's a great place to visit also. And um, they didn't stay there very long. Joseph Smith is killed at Carthage Jail, and then the Mormons eventually go to Salt Lake City. So that was the history. And at that time, the Mormons still today consider Quincy the city of refuge. So it holds a place, I guess, in high regard for many Mormons. 
We're talking today to Rob Mellon. He's the executive director of the Historical Society of Quincy and Adams County, and he's telling us all about the new self-guided history tour that's been made available. Um, You can download this tour at cquincy.com. You can also pick up a copy at the Villa Catherine Tourist Information Center in Quincy. We have information on both of the ways to do that on our website, stlpr.org, if this all has you interested. So much interesting history in Quincy. One of the saddest chapters also takes place in 1838. What a, what a tumultuous time in our nation's history. This has to do with the Potom- Potawatomi Indian community, which was in Indiana. Um, Rob, how did they end up also coming through Quincy? Well, they have, and they still celebrate this, by the way. I don't know if celebrate celebrates the right word. They still honor it, and it's called the Trail of Death, and it starts in northern Indiana, and the Potawatomi were moved and across the country, so they would have been across Indiana, all the way across Illinois and Missouri into Kansas, and there were communities that had to take them in. In most cases, it might have been for like a day, and in Quincy's case, they uh, actually were here for three days on a couple of different sites. There's some locations here. People can go and see some markers where the Potawatomi were held. St. Boniface Church actually had mass for them here while they were here, and then eventually they make their way across. So this is just another uh, situation that we're proud of, and not just the Latter-day Saints, but now the Potawatomi about the same time, where we're a city of refuge, at least at that time. Mm -hmm. And St. Boniface Church uh, played a role in that chapter. It also plays a role in one of your most famous residents. This is Father Augustus Tolton. What made him such a big deal? (laughs) Well, he was born in 1854, so he was born into slavery, and his mother... Uh, was a slave from Kentucky, and his father was a slave from Missouri. He was sold actually in Hannibal. And Hannibal, as many people will know, is you know, that's right down, that's right across the river from us for the most part. And so eventually, Father Tolton's father, um, according to the family legend, left, um, ran away to join the Union Army. And his mother in 1862 decided she had to escape as well. Now, there's some conflicting accounts on whether. They were freed or she escaped slavery. There are accounts that they had to get across uh, from Hannibal, and it was a very harrowing experience. They get across the river, and then the family ends up in Quincy. They live with a a widow at the time, and they start attending St. Boniface, and he starts going to school there. And um, that isn't received very well by some of the other people or parishioners. And so there's a Father McGurr who becomes really important to Father Tolton, and he helps him get uh, into school at St. Lawrence O'Toole, which today is called St. Peter's. He becomes a janitor there. The interesting thing about Father Tolton, at age nine, he goes to work at a tobacco factory here in Quincy and a bottling company as well. And he would go to school at St. Boniface and then at St. Lawrence O'Toole, which is now St. Peter's, um, when he wasn't working. So that was the, the beginning of Father Tolton. He gets called to the priesthood. Father McGurr is very instrumental in this, and he thinks that it would be amazing if if Father Tolton could be, or Augustus at the time, Mm -hmm. would um, get ordained a priest. And so they raise money. The diocese eventually supports it. He's not accepted in any seminary in the United States because they would not accept a black person. And so he's sent to Rome, and that is where he's ordained. That's where Father uh, Tolton is ordained. And then the interesting thing about it is he thinks he's going to be a missionary and sent around the world. I mean, he's the first African-American priest in the whole history of the church, and he thinks he's going to go to Africa, and when he gets his orders, it's actually to come back to Quincy and service the free blacks in Quincy and try to convert uh, that population to, uh, to Catholicism. And so that brings him back to Quincy. Um, he starts at um, St. Boniface, and then eventually he's moved to St. Joseph. And St. Joseph was the black Catholic church. Um, The interesting thing is, he's so charismatic that he starts drawing a lot of parishioners from St. Boniface, because he can sing amazingly, and he gave these great, impassioned um, talks and homilies. And so he becomes super popular. That doesn't make him very popular with the priest at St. Boniface, though. Little rivalry there. (laughs) And so there was a very much of a rivalry because not only are these parishioners going to St. Joseph, but now some of that money is is getting diverted to St. Joseph as well. 
And so he's treated extremely poorly. And uh, he asked for a transfer to Chicago, which is he's granted. And then he goes to Chicago, and he starts St. Monica's Church in Chicago. And unfortunately, there was a heat wave. And um, a lot of people died at that time from heat stroke, and he was stricken by that. He was sick for a while, and they told him that you have to stop, but he wouldn't. He continued his, his um, mission, and he actually collapsed on the streets of, of Chicago. And uh, that's his history. That's Father Tolton. Boy, that's a that's a sad ending to really a remarkable life, and and there's so much good history in Quincy. I'm almost overwhelmed just by the couple of anecdotes you gave us today. <laughs> this this self uh, self guided tour is this something somebody could do in a day, or is this something where they better set aside a weekend? You know, I think it would be good to set aside a weekend. I'm I'm the director of the historical society, and I mentioned the John Wood Mansion. That's an hour long tour of the mansion that still exists, and mm. we take people through it the history of the city and so forth. So as, as well as the guided tour, you've got the Villa Catherine where Holly's office is at. That's an amazing structure that was built in 1900. And anybody that knows Quincy knows that the architecture in general is pretty amazing. Just to drive down Main Street is a treat as well. So this is a, a good weekend getaway here. You're going to keep people busy while they're in town. Yeah, we welcome them completely. Come to Quincy, you know, get away. You know, we have a lot of people come from St. Louis and we certainly welcome that. Well, Rob Mellon, I want to thank you for joining us today and and sharing these highlights. Absolutely. I appreciate it. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, honoring Arbor Day on April 26th with an ongoing commitment to sustainable stewardship and conservation of Missouri's forests. Choosewood.com.